Welcome to the Federalist Society's webinar call. This afternoon, June 2nd, we discussed the courthouse steps decision, City of San Antonio, v. City of San Antonio, Texas v. Hotels.com. My name is Guy DeSanctis, and I am Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the expert on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Charles Campbell, Dean for Academic Affairs and Associate Professor of Law, Faulkner University, Jones School of Law. Throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please submit them through the question and answer feature or the chat so that our speaker will have access to them for when we get to that portion of the webinar. With that, thank you for being with us today. Charles, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you recall back in April, uh, we did the uh, argument review on uh, City of San Antonio versus Hotels.com. Uh, I think I said at the time that I expected a decision by June. We actually, uh, the court beat that timeline a little bit. Uh, we actually had the decision in just over a month on May 27th, so Thursday of last week. Uh, and it was a unanimous decision. We've had a lot of, uh, or at least a fair number, of unanimous decisions this term from the court. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how many more of those we have as we go deeper into June. Uh, but if you will recall, uh, the city of San Antonio litigation was a, a long running piece of litigation by as a class of Texas municipalities, 173 Texas municipalities, who were challenging uh, several major online travel companies, uh, what the court refers to as OTCs, Hotels.com, Expedia, Orbitz, that kind of thing. And the claim in the litigation was that these online travel companies were not withholding enough occupa municipal occupational taxes because they were computing the occupational tax based on the wholesale rate that they were paying to the hotels rather than the retail rate that the uh, persons staying in those hotels were actually paying. And so the city's claim that this was uh, a substantial underpayment uh, and brought suit as a class action in federal court. Now, uh, Houston was pursuing parallel litigation in state court. And uh, in the Houston case uh, over in state court, it went to an inter intermediate court of appeals and the Texas State Court of Appeals uh, held that uh, the online travel companies had not been uh, improperly withholding uh, too low an amount of municipal taxes. Uh, in, while that was proceeding, however, and before they got that appellate decision, uh, the class action litigation was proceeding in federal court uh, with the city of San Antonio as uh, the class representative. And in that litigation in federal court, uh, the municipalities initially won a judgment of approximately $55 million. Uh, and while it, it, took, it took quite a while for some post-trial proceedings uh, to get finished up, but um, in order to stay payment of that judgment, to stay execution on that judgment, uh, the defendants, the OTCs, um, applied uh, for a supersedis bond uh, under Rule 62 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. They negotiated that with the city and um, that's, they ran up about 2.2 almost million dollars uh, in premiums for those uh, supersedis bonds. Uh, initially it was for 68 million to uh, account for the estimated size of the judgment after a year and a half uh, allowed for appeal, but uh, post-trial uh, proceedings dragged out for a couple of years, and so it had to be raised at one point. And uh, so eventually they were insuring an $84 million uh, judgment. Well, when it went to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, the Fifth Circuit uh, deferred to the interpretation of the Texas Court of Appeals, reversed the district court's judgment, uh, or excuse me, vacated the district court's judgment and rendered judgment for the OTCs, the online travel companies. Uh, 
Uh, at that point, then uh, the online travel companies requested their appellate costs under Rule 39 uh, in the Fifth Circuit. Uh, the Fifth Circuit granted that motion. There had been no objection to it uh, from the municipalities. And then, uh, as Rule 39 allows, uh, back in the district court, the online travel companies uh, sought their, uh, as part of their costs, the cost of their supersedis bonds, which amounted to nearly $2.2 million. Uh, at that point, the cities did rather vehemently uh, object to that, and they asked that the district court uh, lower the amount or um, change, either change the allocation or uh, not make the city of San Antonio responsible for the whole amount uh, of the cost reimbursement. Uh, the, the district court found that there were you know, some pretty persuasive arguments that had been made, but that Fifth Circuit precedent uh, held that a district court had no discretion uh, to re-examine the amount of costs or the allocation of costs uh, once the Court of Appeals had entered its cost order, which in this case had allocated 100% of costs uh, to uh, the OTCs because they had succeeded in having the judgment vacated uh, and which they interpreted as essentially being uh, the same as a reversal in this case. And uh, so the district court entered a cost award for $2.2 million. Uh, the municipalities appealed, Fifth Circuit uh, adhered to its uh, circuit precedent, uh, said that the district court lacked the discretion to change uh, the cost allocation. And so uh, the city of San Antonio uh, took the uh, case to the Supreme Court. Their argument um, is distilled down, uh, was essentially uh, very heavily um, relied on the text of Rule 39E, uh, which said that there are costs that are taxable in the district court, and they read into uh, taxable discretion uh, and that was discretion that the Fifth Circuit was not allowing its district courts uh, to exercise. And they made a, you know, a very good argument for that. But uh, the Supreme Court um, rejected that argument nine to nothing. Uh, and so a pretty vigorous uh, rejection of that argument and uh, a holding that uh, Rule 39, quote, does not permit a district court to alter a court of appeals allocation of the costs listed in subdivision E of that rule, unquote. Um, it's a very short opinion by Justice Alito, uh, again, for unanimous court, no concurrences um, or anything of that nature. And we'll talk about a little bit of that uh, towards the end, uh, how the, uh, unanimous opinion incorporates some of the various concerns that various uh, members of the court raised uh, through the course of oral argument. Uh, but the court's uh, analysis proceeds basically in two steps, uh, parts 2A and 2B of the opinion. Um, part 2A, uh, I'm uh, working off of the slip opinion from the court. Part 2A is pages five through nine of the slip opinion. Part 2B is pages nine through 13. So neither of them terribly long, uh, but the court read rule 39 as establishing what it called a quote unquote, cohesive scheme for taxing appellate courts. As noted, it sets out default, default rules that are geared to five potential outcomes of an appeal, dismissal, affirmance, reversal, affirmance in part and reversal in part, and vacature. And each of the default rules tracks the quote, venerable presumption that prevailing parties are entitled to costs, unquote. The court then noted, however, that the prefatory language in section 39A leads into those default rules by saying, unless the court otherwise orders. And so the court read that as giving discretion to the courts of appeals as to whether to go with the default rules or to alter them uh, as they saw fit. And they centered that discretion in the court of appeals, thus implying that it was there was not going to be a second level of discretion back in the district court 
uh, when it was uh, taxing costs under 39E. Um, and the court basically um, cited as its reasons for that is if, for example, they gave a couple of examples, if a court awarded 75 percent uh, of call of appellate costs to a party that won 75 percent of its appeal to allow a second um, range of discretion could alter that um, division of the costs on appeal by allowing the district courts uh, further discretion. And that would upset what the Court of Appeals uh, had intended in its award. Uh, and so the court says, read properly, quote, Rule 39 gives discretion over the allocation of appellate costs to the Courts of Appeals. And then with that settled, it's easy to see why district courts cannot exercise a second layer of discretion. And forgive me, I said 75%, the example they used was 70%. Um, and they said, if the, if the Court of Appeals uh, affirmed and awarded the prevailing appellee 70% of its costs, if the district court in an exercise of its own discretion later reduced those costs by half, the appellee would receive only 35% of its costs in direct violation of the Court of, Ab of Appeals directions. Um, the court then turned uh, to what was sort of the heart of the city's argument from the text of Rule 39, uh, and that was in 39E, where it said that these uh, four categories of costs were taxable in the district court. And very much um, as the parties had laid out an oral argument, they rehearsed the city's argument that taxable is um, permissive language. That means uh, implies discretion. And uh, the uh, online travel companies at oral argument had argued, no, that what, what was really being done by taxable was it was saying where the taxation was to occur, not that it was supposed to imply discretion. The court, relying on uh, the 1990s restyling of the rules of appellate procedure, went back to the old form of Rule 39, which said that court uh, said that costs shall be taxed in the district court. Read taxable as basically saying where to tax, not to imply discretion in the taxing uh, of those uh, costs. Uh, page nine of the slip opinion. The court held that, quote, the real work done by the phrase, quote, taxable in the district court, unquote, is the specification of the court in which those costs are to be taxed, that is, in the district court, unquote. They found that that made good sense since those costs had been incurred in the district court. Um, and uh, the court um, therefore held that the courts of appeals held the discretion on apportioning costs and that that was something that the district court did not have discretion to alter under rule 39E. Um, the rest of the court's opinion was um, devoted to responding to some of uh, the city of San Antonio's practical concerns that uh, a ruling against them might entail. Um, and the first of those was that um, District courts have broad discretion on awarding costs under Rule 54D. It would be confusing uh, to uh, withhold discretion in awarding costs under 39E. Uh, the court said, the court essentially said that's not that complicated, and it gives uh, the Court of Appeals uh, the discretion that it needs for appellate costs, and, and 54 gives the district court the discretion it needs for district court costs. Uh, but they saw no problems from a um, being overly complicated uh, standpoint. Second, um, the city had argued that the Court of Appeals would, might not be well positioned to actually assess uh, cost allocations. Uh, and the court basically, well, said outright, quote, these concerns are overblown, unquote. Um, in part because supersedis uh, bonds you know, rarely reach the size and importance that they had in this litigation. Um, and um, 
And they also noted that the city had not cited any cases uh, where there had been significant difficulties in a court of appeal allocating costs under Rule 39. Um, the court finally said on, on that point that if it was difficult, then uh, the, dis the court of appeals certainly had the option to delegate the task to the district court and noted that uh, many courts of appeals had done so on a case by case basis in the past. The um, third argument that the city made as to the practical problems uh, in withholding discretion from the district courts um, was that it would there was no reason for Rule 39E to be taxed in the district court as opposed to the court of appeals if the district court was simply to enter a ministerial order involving no discretion. Uh, the court responded that um, the costs had been, in, had been incurred in all of these categories in the district court. So the district court would be more familiar with them. And also uh, relying on sections 1920 and 1924 of um, Title 28, noted that its role was not purely ministerial. Section 1924 um, requires the district court to find that costs to be taxed are both correct and necessary. And the court said that's not merely a ministerial function. Um, and, so, and so the court said that it was logical for this to be done at the district court, um, but it did not in involve a broader discretion as the uh, city was seeking to reapportion the costs based on various equitable considerations. The last argument, and probably one of the ones that got the most discussion at, at oral argument, uh, was that the concern from the city that parties would not be able to get review of the allocation of costs under Rule 39E. Um, the court, interestingly, Said, agreed that uh, Rule 39 and the applicable cost statutes could specify more clearly what procedure to follow in order to have uh, objections presented or to have the allocation of costs reviewed. Uh, but they basically responded that uh, they would allow a court to use any um, Ma any manner, any procedural vehicle to raise their objections to the allocation of costs uh, that was consistent with the federal and local rules. Um, and the local rules of the various uh, courts of appeals had come up uh, right at the beginning of oral argument with uh, the chief justices questioning as to why we don't just leave this to local rules. Uh, and they suggested that um, there were a variety of ways that any objections uh, to cost that could be raised. One that the court um, suggested in the opinion was Rule 27, uh, which uh, allows a court to make, uh, allows a party to make a motion for an order. And they said, you just file a motion for an order under Rule 27. That's one way. They also noted that the online travel companies had cited several instances where parties had done it a variety of ways. They had um, objected to costs in their merits briefing, uh, in their objections to the bill of costs in the Court of Appeals under Rule 39D2, uh, and in a petition for rehearing. And basically, the court said, we're not going to foreclose any of these. Anything that's consistent with the relevant federal and local rules will be fine. Uh, and we don't think, uh, in short, that um, interpreting Rule 39 uh, as not giving district courts the discretion to revisit the allocation of cost, we don't think that is going to have uh, nearly the practical problems that the city uh, has um, predicted uh, in its briefing. A couple of points uh, about the opinion um, and the way that it wove a lot of the oral argument questions into the text of the opinion. Um, the references to section 1924 and the district court being required to uh, find that costs were both correct and necessary um, was going back to uh, questioning from Justice Kagan at oral argument. 
uh, and the suggestion that, you know, although and the courts interpreting it here as not giving discretion to reallocate the costs, but there was a non-ministerial function that was to be determined to be done in the district court in determining that those costs were both correct and necessarily incurred. Uh, and so it's not discretion, but it's not also uh, simply rubber stamping um, whatever the party puts forward under Rule 39E as uh, costs that it's seeking to tax. Um, another point, uh, especially at the end on how to raise the objections to costs. Um, that was something that Justice Sotomayor uh, pressed uh, the uh, uh, counsel on at oral argument and uh, expressed some concern about. And I think the court's um, detailed response that, you know, basically any way that is consistent with uh, the federal and local rules will be fine, uh, basically addressed that concern. Uh, there were a lot, there were comments, a, a fair number of comments at oral argument that the city really wasn't very surprised since they had participated in negotiations over these superseded bonds. They knew the size of the verdict. They had some idea of what the premiums were going to cost. Uh, and so this should not have come as a surprise. Um, and then the last point I wanted to make about the uh, opinion is something that we talked about um, after oral argument. The uh, United States had raised um, an issue in a footnote in its uh, brief um, as amicus that um, Section 1920 in Title 28 doesn't mention taxing costs for supersedis bonds. And they noted that there was you know, some question over whether uh, those uh, supersedis bonds were properly taxable as costs when they're mentioned in 39E3, but not mentioned in section 1920. Uh, the court in uh, Crawford Fitting versus J.T. Gibbons, a 1987 case, had read uh, Rule 54 as not giving district courts any discretion to add to the categories of costs listed in section 1920. But then the United States said, but uh, the city has not raised any argument over that, so there's no need for the court to decide it. Justice Thomas, uh, as we discussed uh, after oral, oral argument, uh, asked about that at oral argument, and that finds its way into footnote four in the court's opinion. And they essentially just note um, that the United States had mentioned it, but it was not raised, and so they did not address it. But it again flagged the issue, I think, uh, for potential for future litigation. And I think that was another way incorporating Justice Thomas's concern, you know, maybe we need to look at this, maybe not. I mean, he, he did not indicate that the court needed to look at it, certainly. And the court doesn't indicate that they need to look at it here. They simply say that essentially the United States mentioned this, but it's not raised. Um, and so, you know, we're not going to uh, address it in this opinion. But I think it does raise the profile of that issue. Uh, and potentially is going to lead parties to raise um, the possibility of a conflict between 28 U.S.C. Section 1920 and Federal Rule of Appellate Procedure 39E3. Um, that's uh, all I had prepared to, uh, as introduction to the court, um, to the opinion, and so now uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. I will look. I don't see any open questions, uh, so please uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand or type in your questions, and I will be glad to um, address them, whether I have a good answer or not. Uh, one, one, one to start it off from me. In regard to footnote four, where do you think that's headed? Well, I, if I think parties are going to start objecting. Uh, to taxing the costs of supersedis bonds um, in the district court under uh, 39E3. Uh, it's, and it's going to be in, it'll be a case where it's a substantial amount for those premiums to be taxed, uh, but there's essentially 
you know, for a party that is facing a tax, uh, having those costs taxed in the district court, um, there is very little downside to raising an objection um, to those, to taxing those supersedis uh, bond premiums. Um, and, you know, I think the argument is going to line up uh, basically um, is Rule 39 limited to the categories of costs in Section 1920, like Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 54 is, or um, is Rule 39, Appellate Rule 39, as a later enacted or adopted rule, is the later in time controlling? Um, to my knowledge, there's really only one appellate court decision that I've seen, and there may be others that I've just missed. But the Seventh Circuit um, addressed the issue in Republic Tobacco Company versus North Atlantic Trading Company Incorporated in 2007. And the citation on that is 481 F3rd 442. And the Seventh Circuit said basically, um, you know, the, the later in time controls, Rule 39, uh, was promulgated uh, at, and adopted after Section 1920, and therefore Rule 39 E3 controls and the costs of supersedis uh, bond premiums are taxable. Now, um, the, I, I think the argument uh, on the other side that someone may develop is um, that is correct if taxing costs in this way is viewed as being procedural with no effect on substantive rights. Um, somebody may try and develop an argument that the taxation of costs, which allows a recovery, uh, essentially is allowing uh, a party to recover money from its opponent and therefore has some substantive component and therefore is beyond rulemaking authority. Now, I don't know how that's going to go, but I do suspect that's where some parties will head with the argument. Uh, is to the substantive rights proviso in section uh, in Title 28, Section 2072B. Uh, and that'll be an interesting question. Um, and I, I can't predict where they're going to head with that. All right. Um, the question, um, I have a question here. Uh, how did the court, how did the case get into federal court in the first place? Uh, and if I recall correctly, I think it was um, diversity, but I'm not entirely certain of that, but I believe it was diversity jurisdiction. I think there's one question in the chat as well. Mm. Yes. Do you see an impact on future litigation? Any impact on class action practice? Well, I, it, as I mentioned, I think um, certainly someone is going to raise this when they're facing um, a cost bill uh, for supersedis bond premiums, and they know that that's coming. Uh, I think they're going to challenge it. And the opinion here basically lays out, you need to raise that challenge in the Court of Appeals. Uh, and uh, so I expect that they will do that. And if, if the Court of Appeals, where their appeal is pending, has a local rule on it, then they will follow the local rule. If not, any of these options should be sufficient uh, that are laid out on page 11, uh, excuse me, page... Uh, 13 in the slip opinion. And so I think that is going to get litigated. The other thing I think uh, is likely to happen in class action practice is uh, I think um, class reps are going to have, uh, at least where they perceive that this issue may be coming up, I would expect there to be some sort of arrangement in writing over uh, the apportionment of, of costs uh, amongst the class members. If the class, if there's a significant risk that the class members uh, might have to pay um, uh, the costs of uh, a supersedis bond premiums, uh, 
Now, a lot of, now that depends a good bit on them for seeing that it's going to come. Uh, I also think it is going to uh, potentially um, make uh, parties who win the judgment in the district court perhaps be somewhat more flexible as to whether they are going to require a supersedis bond, um, especially where they have pretty good assurance from the financials of uh, whoever the defendant is um, that they will be able to cover uh, the full judgment uh, without much difficulty. Um, I think that uh, some plaintiffs might be more amenable to um, taking reassurances from the defendant that they financially have the wherewithal without uh, uh, retaining a bond uh, to pay the costs. But um, it's you know, in this very small category of cases where you have a very large monetary judgment uh, that then gets reversed, um, the supersedis bond premiums become a significant bargaining chip, a chip and significant leverage uh, that the plaintiff has. Uh, the problem with it is that it can backfire if it gets reversed on appeal. Uh, and so I, I think that's going to... Um, cause a lot of attorneys to be a little more cautious uh, in being so aggressive in insisting on a supersedis bond uh, with the essential, well, as a given, but only with defendants where they think they actually have the financial wherewithal uh, to meet the judgment. Thank you for that. And thank you for those questions. At the moment, it doesn't appear we have any more questions. Are there any closing remarks you'd like to make? Uh, no, uh, well, I, I'll make a, a brief um, close. Uh, I think Ed Whelan posted uh, last week that this, <laughs> tongue in cheek, uh, the opinion everyone's been waiting on uh, with bated breath is now out. Um, and, you know, this was not by any means the biggest um, case that the court had taken. I, I was a little bit surprised about the way it came out. Um, and I think it does uh, lay some ground rules and raises. Um, a potential rules enabling act question uh, for future litigation. And so I think it's one of those uh, potentially sleeper cases that might have more impact down the road than is initially perceived. Thank you for that. On behalf of the Federalist Society, I wanna thank our expert, Charles Campbell, for the benefit of his valuable time and expertise today. And I want to thank our audience for calling in and participating. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming teleforum calls and virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.